In this short video, we're going to learn a method for solving non-homogeneous equations, and it's called undetermined coefficients. And we're going to learn the method via superposition. So when we want to solve a non-homogeneous linear differential equation, we need two solutions. First, we need the solution to the homogeneous uh, equation, the corresponding homogeneous equation, that is where we replace g of x with a zero. That's called the complementary function. Again, that's the solution to the corresponding homogeneous differential equation. And we need any particular solution, and that we call yp. So our general solution then is the sum of the complementary solution plus the particular solution. So the method of undetermined coefficients using superposition uh, starts with making an educated guess about the particular solution based on the right-hand side function. So it's not just a guess, it's an intelligent guess. However, this method is limited to differential equations that have constant coefficients and whose right-hand side is a combination of a limited set of functions, which includes constant functions and polynomials, exponentials, and sine and cosine functions. So there's a lot of functions that are left out. For example, no rational functions, log functions. The only trig functions are sine and cosine, no tangent or secant, and no inverse uh, trig functions either. And many other functions would be excluded from this method. So let's start with an example. We have y double prime plus 4y prime minus 2y equals a polynomial 2x squared minus 3x plus 6. So since the right hand side uh, function is a polynomial, we're going to see that we're going to try to find a particular solution, which is also a polynomial. But let's start with the solution to the homogeneous equation. We'll go ahead and find our auxiliary equation. We're going to go ahead and solve that with the uh, quadratic formula. That gives us two real distinct roots. And so this would be our two parameter family of solutions the homogeneous equation. And so now let's see the right hand side is a quadratic function, a quadratic polynomial. So let's assume that the particular solution is also a quadratic polynomial. Uh, that would make sense that if I were to take the first and second derivatives, they would also be polynomials. And so therefore, a linear combination of the function and its derivatives would be a right-hand side polynomial. So let's go ahead and take those first and second derivatives. Looks like I have uh, chopped off a p there. Okay, and then substitute the y, the y prime and the y double prime back into the non-homogeneous differential equation. So that gives us this following equation here. And then what we're going to do next should remind us of how we solve problems with partial fractions. So if these two, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, are both polynomials, and the only way two polynomials can be equal is if corresponding coefficients are equal. In other words, um, the coefficient on x squared must be the same, the coefficient on x, and the constants have to equal each other. So that would mean that negative 2a would have to equal 2, so the negative 2a from the left-hand side equals 2 from the right-hand side, and that gives us the value of a. And then Let's look at the coefficients on x from both the left-hand side and the right-hand side, set those equal to each other. We already found the value of a, and so we can determine the value of b from that equation. And finally, 
we'll set the constant equal to each other. Now we knew the value of a and the value of b, so from this last equation I could determine the value of c. And now we've determined our particular solution. The coefficient on x squared is negative 1, the coefficient on x is negative 5 halves, and the constant coefficient is negative 9. So my general solution will be the complementary solution, the solution to the homogeneous problem, plus the particular solution that we found. Now this is by no means the only particular solution, but that's all we need is just one particular solution. And so summing those together, that gives you the general solution. In this example, we're just going to find the particular solution. Uh, we notice now that the uh, right-hand side is a sine function, but we know that we're going to have to take the first derivative and the second derivative. And so when I take the derivatives of sine, I get sine and cosine. So we're going to look for a particular solution, which is a linear combination of sine of 3x and cosine of 3x. Well, we're going to proceed in the same way. We're going to find the first and second derivative. We're going to substitute those first and second derivatives back into the non-homogeneous equation. And then what we'll do is we'll look for corresponding coefficients on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So to save some algebra, I didn't go ahead and multiply this out and collect like terms. I'm just going to look for the like terms. I'm going to, I know that I have two types of terms. I have a sine of 3x and a cosine of 3x. So just looking now at what my uh, coefficients would be on a sine of 3x. Well, on the left-hand side, I have a negative 9a, and then I'm going to get a positive 3b, and then I'm going to get a positive a and that's going to equal 2 on the right-hand side. And for the coefficients on cosine of 3x, I have a negative 9b here. I'll have a negative 3a. And then I'm going to have a positive b. And then there's no uh, cosine term on the right-hand side, so that's going to equal 0. So then I go ahead and solve this system of equations using any method of my choosing, elimination, substitution, a matrix method, Kramer's rule, whatever you want. And you're going to find that the solution is A equals negative 16 over 73 and B equals 6 over 73. So then my particular solution would be, well, a is my coefficient on uh, sine of 3x, b is the coefficient on cosine of 3x. Again, in this example, example 3, we're just going to find a particular solution. Now notice that the uh, right-hand side has a polynomial and then an exponential, actually the product of x and an exponential. So really what we could do is say, all right, if I have a polynomial, that's my g1 and the uh, x times the exponential is g2. So I'll try to determine the form of the particular solution for each one of those separately and then add them together. So for uh, the polynomial, it's a linear, so I'm going to use ax plus b. And then for x times e to the 2x, I'm going to use a constant times e to the 2x and another constant, I mean a constant times x e to the 2x plus a different constant times e to the 2x. And so, you know, why do I use two forms here? Because remember, we're looking at the derivatives of these functions, and the derivative of x e to the 2x has an e to the 2x term. So we need to have 
that in our particular solution. Now you may be wondering why we skipped over the letter D, and that's because uh, D represents a differential operator, and we don't want to get confused. So when we're using these constants yeah, as uppercase letters, we're just going to skip over uppercase D. All right, so combine those two particular solutions together by just adding them. And we'll proceed as we did in the previous examples. We'll take the first derivative. We'll take the second derivative. Uh, there's some like terms here, so let's clean up that second derivative, make it a little bit easier. Looks like I could have factored out a four as well. Uh, and substitute it back into the non-homogeneous differential equation. And proceed as before. We want to look at the coefficients of corresponding terms on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I have and x e to the 2x is one of the terms. So I have a 4c and then a minus 2, but then multiply by 2, another minus, minus 4c, and then a minus 3c, and that's going to equal 6. And that is enough to determine the value of c being negative 2. And then we'll look at the coefficients on each side on the e to the 2x term. And that's enough to determine what the value of e is, uppercase e. We look at the coefficients on the x term. I only have a negative 3a on the left. And that has to equal 4. So a is negative 4 thirds. And then finally, the constants. You know, we have one constant term on the left-hand side, and I have a constant term on the right-hand side, which determines the value of b. So then the four terms in our particular solution then have been determined with those coefficients that we found from solving this linear system. Now here's something that's a little bit different. And so even though we're only asked to find a particular solution, Let's start by finding the complementary solution. That is the solution to the homogeneous problem. So our uh, auxiliary equation is m squared minus 5y plus 4 equals 0. We're going to get two distinct real roots, m equals 4 and m equals 1. So the complementary solution is c1 e to the 4x plus c2 e to the x. So our right hand side has 8 e to the x. So I can't use, and this is important, so pay attention here, a constant times e to the x as my particular solution because that's actually a solution to the homogeneous equation. So if I were to put a e to the x into the differential equation, the right-hand side could never be 8 e to the x. It's always going to be 0. Again, that's what it means for the complementary solution. It means that when you plug in one of those solutions, you'll get 0 on the right-hand side. So instead of trying e to the x, we're going to try x times e to the x. I know that when I take the derivative of x e to the x, it's going to include a term with a coefficient on e to the x. So certainly within the first and second derivative, it's possible to get a linear combination there that adds up to 8 e to the x. So let's go ahead and take the first derivative and take the second derivative, take those expressions, plug them into the non-homogeneous differential equation, and let's go ahead and, sub and look at the corresponding coefficients. Now look that I have two types of terms. I have just plain e to the x 
and I have x e to the x. So I'm going to get two equations, but there's only one unknown. That's uppercase a. So that tells me that one of those equations should be redundant, or I should have a dependent system of equations. And so sure enough, if I look at the coefficients on x e to the x, I wind up with an identity, 0 equals 0. But if I look at the coefficients on e to the x, then I have an independent equation, and I can determine the value of a as negative 8 thirds. Now remember, this coefficient a is the coefficient on x e to the x. And so my solution, my particular solution, is negative 8 thirds times x e to the x. Even though this a was determined by looking at the coefficients on e to the x, in the solution, it is the coefficient of x e to the x. So how do you know what to try for y sub p? There is a little bit of practice involved before you can uh, try. And what's nice about this formula or this uh, method is that if you've left out a term, uh, you're going to see that in your uh, system of equations. It's not going to make sense. You might get a contradiction. You might get 0 equals 1. And that would tell you that either you made a mistake or you didn't start with the right form of y sub p. And as a general rule, uh, if you're not sure what to do, multiply the solution that you started with, with by x, just like we did uh, in the previous example. So you can refer to this table. It's in your book. And I will provide you this table uh, if you, uh, when you're taking an exam for some guidance there. However, memorizing the table is not really that necessary if you remember these general rules. So the first situation is where you have no duplication in terms between the solution to the homogeneous equation and your trial function for the particular solution. In which case then <clears throat> your uh, y sub p, your trial function, should have the form of a linear combination of all the linearly independent functions that get generated by repeated differentiation of g of x. And the second case is that uh, if you your trial function shares a term which is a solution to the homogeneous problem, then you're going to replace that term uh, with that term multiplied by x to the power of n. And n is going to be the smallest integer that eliminates the duplication. OK, so let's look at uh, an initial value problem that we're asked to solve. We have a non-homogeneous equation with uh, two initial conditions. So we'll proceed as before. We're going to go ahead and find the complementary function, the solution to the homogeneous function. So the solution to the auxiliary equation is uh, plus or minus i. And so our complementary function is a constant c1 times cosine of x plus a constant c2 times sine of x. So we see on the right hand side, we have a uh, constant times sine of x. So in our trial function, I can't use sine of x or cosine of x. So I multiply both of those by x. So I'll have x times sine of x and x times cosine of x. And then since I have the 4x, I'm going to also include an ax plus b. So proceed as before. Take the first derivative. Take the second derivative. Substitute the values for the function, the first derivative, and the second derivative. 
back into the non-homogeneous equation. And then look at four corresponding coefficients. So again, here I have uh, how many types of terms? I have an x times sine of x. I have uh, just a sine of x. I have x times cosine of x, and then just a cosine of x. I have an x term, and I have a constant term. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six equations that I'm going to get, but there's only four unknowns. So that tells me I should have a dependent system. Two of the equations should be redundant. And again, here it's pretty obvious that the first two just give me zero equals zero. So there's no information stored in those first two equations. But from the remaining four, I can uh, clearly get the values of A, B, C, and E. So from those values, I can write down my particular solution. Uh, so I know the particular solution. I know the complementary solution and I know my initial conditions. So let's impose the initial conditions now to my general solution and find the value of C1 and C2. So C1 turns out to be nine pi. And then I need the derivative of the general solution to impose the second initial condition because that is an initial condition for the derivative. And I get that my C2 value is seven. And so this is my solution to the initial value problem. And then I want to end this by just reminding you that for uh, almost any time you're asked to solve a differential equation or initial value problem or boundary value problem, you are always able to check your answer by go ahead and differentiating your solution as many times as are necessary, and then substituting those values back into the original equation, and you should get an identity. So in other words, the left-hand side should equal the right-hand side.